Now, my wife has seen me cry like two or three times. Uh, that might be a me thing. I should fix that. I'm going to work on that. Um, but one of those times is when we saw the new Lion King in movie theaters. Now, you might be like a Lion King purist and say, Josh, those weird lifelike cats without like real smiles, that didn't really do much for me. But for me, it made me cry when little baby Simba was held up on Pride Rock. The music rose. My childhood came flooding back to me. That made me cry. But as you know, this baby cub, he grows into a boy cub who loses his dad. And his dad, Mufasa, is a good king. His life's taken by his brother Scar. Now, I've always found it it fascinating that as soon as Scar ceases power, everything goes wrong. Everything dies. The whole land is just covered in darkness. Plants die, rivers dry up, suddenly animal bones are being used as Christmas decorations. You know that you're truly evil when the trees die when you take the throne. It's like seriously, seriously bad. And in a very real sense, this is how leaderships work. Companies can rise and fall based on what the public thinks about a CEO. Economies can collapse when consumers don't trust presidents. Kids, you know what a bad substitute teacher does to one classroom. <laughs> Chaos. Psalm 89 starts with good news all about a good king, David, and greater news about a greater king, Jesus. And it closes with lament and anguish as the psalmist looks around and wonders if God really is going to do what God promised. He looks around in surprise when he sees the world that he is in looks more like Scar's world and less like Mufasa's world. Was God really going to do what he promised? Was there really going to be a king on King David's throne forever? And he concludes 52 verses after that question's asked with, yes, God can be trusted. He says, blessed be the Lord forever. Now, this is a long psalm. I have joked that uh, I'll just spend one minute per verse, and we'll be here 52 minutes. But um, that might not be funny for you moms and dads trying to hold kids down now. So um, I'm not going to exposit this whole thing, but I will take you through this. And let's see what our response can be when we really know that King Jesus is king. So, here's three. Because Jesus is king, number one, we can trust his unfailing love. Number two, we can anticipate his undefeated rule. And number three, we can have hope in uncertain times. So first, because Jesus is king, we can trust his unfailing love. Now, Psalm 89 was written by Ethan the Ezraite. You might have not known Ethan is a biblical name, but yes, it is. We don't know much about this guy, but we do know this. In 1 Kings chapter 4, he's brought up as a very wise man. When Solomon, the wisest man in world history, is being described, the biblical author says this. For Solomon, he was wiser than all other men wiser than Ethan the Ezraite. So for God's word to point out that Solomon's even wiser than Ethan tells us Ethan must have been known for his wisdom. And this wise poet, this wise songwriter, he starts this psalm with certainty and trust in who God is. Look at verse 1. He says, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Ethan has seen what the Jesus storybook Bible calls the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. See, he was so convinced of God's love that he couldn't help but make it known to anybody. My family and I were big fans of this tavern called Ellie's. It's right down here. Um, the food and drinks are great. Owners are super sweet. There's a little kids area that kids can play. We're so convinced of the goodness of this place that we will tell everybody who will hear us out. And we invite friends to come with us. If you know me, you might know that. It's our joy to introduce friends to Ellie's. You don't have to convince me. 
And if you want to go with us after church, let me know. Um, the good food and the great staff that convinced us of Ellie's goodness. So what convinced the psalmist of the steadfast love of God? Next verse, he says, For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. God's covenant with David convinces the psalmist here of God's forever love. He looks at this seemingly crazy promise that God made to King David, and he's convinced, oh, God really does love me, and I should tell everybody. He looks back at 2 Samuel. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, why is one promise to a long-dead king good news? Why is it good news that should even convince you and I in Baltimore, Christmas 2023, of God's love for us? See, this covenant is not just about King David. You probably know this, but right now, David is not king. He's not ruling. He's not reigning. He's died, and he has not risen again. He was a good king, but right now, nobody lives under the kingship of King David. In Matthew 1, the New Testament starts with genealogy, a big family list. This person was father of this person who was father of this person who was mother of this person. And it keeps going until it leads right to, right to Jesus. See, David received this promise, and Jesus fulfilled this promise. Jesus is the king ruling and reigning on David's throne. Jesus, the son of David, is the greater king that this text points to. And this greater king, Jesus, is why you and I can trust God's unfailing love right now. Because God loved us so much that he sent his only son. Jesus' perfect life on your behalf, his death in your place, that shows us God's unfailing love. That is why when you and I need convincing of this gospel truth, when our hearts forget this, we can just look up at the, at the empty cross, the empty tomb. Jesus is why, like the psalmist, you and I can be convinced of God's love. So much so that we can't help but make his faithfulness known to all generations. That's why we're here right now, right? To make his faithfulness known. That's why we have city kids. Because all generations should hear of this faithfulness. And that's what we're called to do every single day, Christ follower. Make his name known. See, if you trust God's unfailing love because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, don't keep that to yourself. Jesus is worth sharing. He's worth sharing with your next door neighbor. He's worth proclaiming to your coworker. Jesus is worth, is worth bringing up at Christmas meals with your unbelieving family. Kids, Jesus is worth sharing at the Patterson Park Playground. Why? Well, look back at this text. Verse 9, Jesus is the king ruling over the raging sea, silencing it with his gentle strength. In verse 12, Jesus is the creator of the north and the south, stepping into the world that he created with humility to save it. Jesus is the mighty arm of God in verse 13 defeating sin forever with his death and resurrection. And what does that mean for us who worship this risen king? We are a blessed people. Verses 15 to 18 tells us of all of the blessings promised to Jesus' people. We get to shout for joy. Because of Jesus, we get to be in the light. We get to exalt his name. We get to enjoy his righteousness. We get to be protected by his strength. These are promises that the Christ follower can hold on to with joy. And these are the fruits of God's unfailing love to his people. Because Jesus is king, number one, we can trust his unfailing love. And number two, we can anticipate his undefeated rule. Verse 19, of old you have spoken in a vision to your godly one, and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. 
I have exalted one chosen from the people. The Psalms foretell Jesus again and again and again. And this chunk of scripture right here, the same text Noel just read for us, is one of those moments. When Psalmist Ethan wrote this, David's son Solomon was king. And back then, this could have been read as thinking, okay, this is just about David. But we know now that, once again, what the Jesus Storybook Bible says is true. Every story whispers his name, including this one. Yes, David was chosen from the people and exalted, but Jesus even more so. These kingly promises are true of King David, but even more so of King Jesus. Of course, Jesus didn't come from humanity in the same way that David did. David was a man, and Jesus was more than that. But not only was Jesus a man, he was the the Son of God. Jesus, the Son of God, chose to come into this world as one of the people. Instead of Jesus coming as a rich king born in a big palace to a rich mom and dad, Jesus chose to come into human history human history, as a poor Jewish boy in a small town. Instead of having powerful parents, Jesus had a teenage, unwed mom and a carpenter dad. See, Jesus came from the people of God, and God chose to exalt him. Next, the psalmist moves into the anticipation of what God's going to do with this humble king. God's people can anticipate that that number one, his enemies will be, will be defeated, his throne will be established, and his reign will be unending. So first, his enemies will be defeated. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. I study U.S. presidents for funsies. I'm sure most of you do that, right? Uh, my my three-year-old girl just found a couple days ago my George W. Bush jack-in-the-box that when you turn it, it plays Hail to the Chief, and then George W. Bush just pops out. All of you have that, right? Super cool. Um, I found that at, at an estate sale. Um, <laughs> every president has wins and losses, right? Sometimes they end up on top, sometimes their enemies do. Politics are known for compromise, and no world leader wins every single time except for King Jesus. See, Jesus doesn't have losses. He only has wins. Boys and girls, if you played Twister with Jesus, he would win every time. Even when it looks like Jesus was losing, when he was arrested, beaten, and nailed to a cross, he was still winning. Jesus, his enemies, thought in that moment they were defeating him, but really he was defeating them. When Jesus went to that cross, he beat sin and he beat death once and forever. Our greatest enemies defeated forever. On the third day when Jesus rose again, Jesus showed all of his enemies these truths. Jesus will not be outwitted by the enemy. Jesus will not be humbled by the wicked. Jesus' foes will be crushed under his feet, just like Genesis 3 looks to. Those who hate him will be struck down. And this means that for the Christ follower, we can walk through life with an anticipation of victory. We can have what Pastor Mutasib calls gospel chill. No matter what we face, we serve a king who has already won, who already defeated the greatest enemy. I have dear friends back in Texas named Brady and Adam, and they had to say goodbye this year to their little girl. Amy had some very, very extreme special needs, but her family loved her with Christ's love, showed her Christ's love, and showed everybody who saw them Christ's love. And I will tell you this, when they held their little girl that day, that last day, it probably didn't feel like victory. But Jesus, even in that moment, was doing healing work. Adam wrote to me, telling me about putting her bed away after she went to heaven. And here's what Adam said. Knowing that God is fully on the throne and has our Amy girl up there in heaven with him, 
lets us remind ourselves that this earthly bed, material things, are nothing compared to the bed that she's sleeping in right now. We talked about how beautiful her bed must be and how she probably remembers her early bed and laughs about how much she hated it. Even on the hardest days where we're all struggling to get through our grief, we remind ourselves that Jesus is king, that she is healed, jumping through fields of wildflowers, and that gives us strength to keep going. We always try to end our big grief moments by thinking, what is she doing in heaven right now? And there's no greater peace than to know that she's being taken care of. They know Jesus is the victorious king, that he will never be outwitted by his enemies, not even in death. For followers of Jesus, like Adam and Brady, this gives them immense peace and immense loss. And for the non-Christ follower, for those of you who don't follow Jesus, this is a terrifying truth. Because either you're with Jesus or you're against Jesus. To be against Jesus is to be against the victorious king, the undefeated champion who will prevail over his enemies forever. Don't be caught as an enemy of Christ. Come to him today. Jesus rejoices in making his enemies his friends. Next, his throne will be established. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Like we saw last week, Pastor Wilson pointed us back to Hebrews. Jesus is the firstborn spoken here. That means that he gets all of God's inheritance blessings. God promises his faithfulness and steadfast love and that he will display it through this king on the throne. His rule and reign will be so great that he will have power over the sea. When the Hebrews talked about the sea, they thought about the chaos that overwhelmed them. Jesus rules over that chaos. He has power to rule over your chaos too. Jesus has power to rule over the chaos of 36-hour ICU shifts. Jesus has power to rule over the chaos of family holidays. Jesus has power to rule over the chaos of having your preschooler in church. Jesus has power to rule over the chaos of marriage and parenting. My sweet wife, last week, um, we had pest control come, and they, they always give like this two-hour block, right? So, of course, they came while she was on Zoom with a doctor and while my little girl was fighting her nap time. Mad chaos. Jesus had power over that chaos, and she said Jesus is why she was able to stay calm in the midst of it. This, an this anticipated king, he is the son of God. He is the rock of salvation. He is the firstborn. He is the highest king, the king of all kings. Every world leader has restrictions on their power. Even those who have seemingly unrestricted power, like Kim Jong-un, he does not have power over Baltimore. He is restricted by time and space, but not Jesus. Jesus, the highest king, has unrestricted power. Abraham Kuyper says this, There is not a square inch the whole domain over human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Lastly, Jesus' reign will be unending. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever. And my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever. And his throne is the days of heaven. Jesus won't be term limited. Jesus won't be voted out. Jesus won't leave you when times get tough. We can look forward to the forever reign of King Jesus. It's hard to even think of what that word means, forever. Forever is such a big word. When I come home for lunch, my three-year-old girl says, Daddy, can you stay home from work forever? In her mind, she means just a really long time. If I stay until nap time, that counts. But Jesus really will sit on his throne forever. A billion years from now, Jesus will still be on his throne with eternity in front of him. 
And I don't know about you, but this gives me constant hope. When the news looks scary and unprecedented every single day, and that word just loses all me meaning, I can stand on this truth, that my king will sit on his throne forever. Every problem and pain in this world is fleeting, but Jesus' rule is not. And nothing topples Jesus from his throne. Death didn't do it, and friend, you and I can't do it. Even when we're faithless, Jesus is faithful. Verse 30 says this, If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the words that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever. A faithful witness in the skies. Yes, Jesus will discipline those who he loves. Kids, when, you're, when your mom and dad discipline you, it's because they love you. They want you to grow up into strong men and women of God who love and serve Jesus. Just like we tell my little girl, we love you and nothing can change that. But in an even greater way, Jesus loves those who he disciplines. His discipline doesn't change that he's the forever reigning king, filled with steadfast love for his people. Jesus is saying here, even when you fail me, I won't fail you. Even when you're faithless, I'm faithful. Even when my people need sin and need and need and need disciplining, even when they break their promises, I'm not going to break mine. Because Jesus is king, we can trust his unfailing love, we can anticipate his undefeated rule, and we can have hope in uncertain times. Psalm 89 takes a hard turn here. We go from sunny skies to stormy seas. It goes from trust in King Jesus and his unfailing love, anticipation of his undefeated rule, to asking some really hard questions and really even pointing fingers at the king. The psalmist writes this, But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. In verses 38 to 45, the psalmist seems to accuse God of going back on his word. The psalmist says, you've cast him off. You've rejected him. You're full of wrath against him. God said, I will not violate my covenant. And the psalmist here says, you've renounced your covenant. We've all felt this, right? This is when, it, when Ethan, the psalmist, looks around and thinks, well, it sure looks like the throne's about to be toppled. It sure looks like your promise isn't going to come to pass. It sure looks like victory is not really coming. Ethan was seeing King Solomon floundering as king in sin and thought maybe God really isn't going to keep a king on the throne forever. Maybe his discipline is really removing his hand from us. That makes me think of Saturday. Not Saturday, but Saturday. The day in between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. The Saturday. <laughs> that day, Jesus had lived, he loved, he died, and that looked like that was it. It looked like God's promise was not going to come true. How was a dead king going to save his people? How is a crucified Jesus victorious? Was it all over? The psalmist shows us that God is strong enough to take these questions. When we're in those, those deep, dark moments of hopelessness, it's good and right to ask those hard questions. It's good and right to go to the throne of grace in, in a lament. He asks, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity you have created all children of man. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? 
Maybe this is where you're at right now. Maybe you feel like God's being silent. Maybe you feel like he's being wrathful towards you. Maybe you feel like there's a huge gap between God's promises of his goodness and where you're at right now. So where's the hope? How does this hope point to God in times of uncertainty? The answers to these questions does. Will you hide yourself forever? No, God made himself visible through Christ Jesus. How long will your wrath burn? Jesus took on God's wrath so, to, so that you don't have to. He is the one in verses 50 and 51 who's been mocked and, and, and insulted on our behalf. Who can live and never see death? We can because of the saving work of Christ Jesus. Who has the power to deliver souls? Where is your steadfast love? Where is your faithfulness? Jesus. Because Jesus is king, we can have hope in times of uncertainty. Jesus is the one with the power to deliver souls. Jesus is the proof of God's steadfast love, his faithfulness. Jesus is why this psalm ends with praise even in dark uncertainty. Verse 52 says this, Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. At the end of the, of the Lion King, yes, we're back there. Simba comes back to his king, king, kingdom. He defeats Scar, and he takes the king's crown. Simba's a good king, and under his reign, the kingdom seems to come back to life. Jesus is a good king, my friends. Even though days might look like Scar's land, Jesus is coming. He came first as a humble child, and he's coming back again as a conquering king. We can trust his unfailing love. We can give him praise. We can anticipate his undefeated rule, resulting in gospel chill. We can have hope in uncertain times, because the king is, is coming, and he will make all things right. Let's pray. Father God, you are good. You are so good. On days that are dark, on days that are sad or scary or confusing, God, remind us of your unfailing love through Christ Jesus. Help us know that because you've lived, because you've loved, because you've died, because you've risen again, God, we can have life with you, and that means everything. God, thank you for the cross. This Christmas, help us keep Jesus at the very center. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. It's all in your holy name. All of God's kids said... Amen.